So good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. In today's session, we are going to cover my lecture number 74 of my lecture series. This will cover the end of life guidance for diabetes care. This is uh, an important section which is incorporated in the Joint British Diabetic Society guidelines, which were released in February 2023, surrounding inpatient care of the frail older adults with diabetes. These are the guidelines were initially published separately in 2021, November, and they then later incorporated in February 2023 as a part of this guideline. So again, it's a very important session for the exams and in clinical practice as well. So let's start right away and we'll do it via case-based approach. So we have a 70-year-old man known to suffer from type 1 diabetes, lifelong, recently admitted three days ago with stroke and aspiration pneumonia. He's usually on a basal bolus insulin regimen, getting insulin glargine, which is his long-acting insulin, 20 units at night, and as part, Novorapid, uh, which he takes three times a day before meals. Despite all active medical treatment, his general condition has deteriorated, and the team has decided that he is for end-of-life care pathway. He is unconscious. In such a patient with type 1 diabetes, who is now on the end-of-life care pathway, what should be the next best action what we should be doing? So should we switch his insulin to variable rate insulin fusion? Should we, should we stop all his insulins and just monitor his blood glucose four times a day? Should we stop glargine and continue with Novorapid three times daily? Should we continue the glargine and adjust the doses according to the evening blood glucose? Or should we check glucose frequently and just give short doses of start doses of aspart insulin uh, if the blood glucose is more than 15 millimole per liter? So... This pathway will answer our question. Is This is the pathway which is present in that guidelines, a very important pathway for exams, which covers the diabetes management in the last few days of life. So clearly mentioned if a type 2 diabetic is diet controlled or metformin treated, we should stop monitoring the blood glucose in this scenario. If the patient is a type 2 diabetic on other tablets, it can be anything like DPP for inhibitors or SUs or SGLT2 inhibitors for that matter, and or insulin, and or GLP-1 receptor agonist. And in such a scenario, we stop the tablets and the GLP-1 receptor agonist. We should also consider stopping insulin if the individual is requiring only a small dose and the blood glucose are usually less than 10 millimole per liter. In this case scenario, we even consider stopping the insulin. If insulin is stopped in this particular case where the requirement is less, then if there is a rise in blood glucose happening, suppose if the blood glucose is going over 20 millimole per liter, then we should give six units of aspart insulin or Lispro or Epidra. So any short-acting insulin can be given. And then we should recheck the capillary blood glucose after two hours. If the individual does require rapid-acting insulin more than twice, then consider daily we can add in an intermediate-acting insulin like isophilin insulin or a long-acting insulin analog like Glargine, which is Lantus, or Degludec, which is Traceba for that matter. If the insulin is continued from the beginning, Prescribe once daily morning dose of isophane insulin. So instead of the bedtime dose, we shift to morning. Or long-acting insulin glargine or insulin degludec. And this should be based on 25% less than the total previous daily insulin dose. So whatever was this total previous insulin dose before the admission, this dose which we are going to put in is going to be 25% lesser than that. So that's the recommendation as per guidelines. Then going further, we should check blood glucose once a day at tea time. If below 8 millimole per liter, reduce the insulin dose by 10 to 20 percent. If above 20 millimole per liter, increase the insulin dose by 10 to 20 percent to reduce the risk of symptoms or ketosis. Now, last scenario is of type 1 diabetic patient. Our patient in the question scenario, the guidelines clearly recommend in this algorithm that we should continue the once daily morning dose of insulin glargine. Or, for example, if the patient was insulin degludec with reduction in the dose. Okay. Check blood glucose once daily at T time. If below 8 millimole, reduce the insulin dose by 10 to 20 percent. If above 20 millimole, increase the insulin dose by 10 to 20 percent to reduce the risk of uh, further hyperglycemic symptoms or ketosis. So, this is a very important algorithm. We should know uh, thoroughly to answer the questions which appear in the exam. So, the correct answer continue the glargine and adjust the blood glucose according to the evening blood glucose. So as I mentioned to you, these guidelines, what we are going to discuss further in the next subsequent slides is the end of life guidance for diabetes care initially published in November, 2021. 
and then it was incorporated as the section number 12 in the February 2023 guidelines for the inpatient care of the frere of the older adults with diabetes. So there are some important things which are mentioned in these guidelines, which will go step by step. So tailoring medications, including the use of glucose lowering therapies in end of life of diabetes care. We have adopted four stages. So the guidelines have adopted four stages, A to D from the gold standards framework. Within the end of life scenario for considering the use of glucose lowering therapies and other relevant drug therapies. These are color coded in line with other nationally recognized stages of end of life. So blue is all from diagnosis table with year plus prognosis. So basically this is the best uh, case scenario where uh, the patient is stable overall and his prognosis is years plus. In terms of uh, the green, there are some benefits, uh, but it's still an unstable or advanced disease and the prognosis is in months. Yellow is continuing care, uh, deteriorating condition, and the prognosis is only in weeks. Red is terminal care, or uh, it has only prognosis in days. So blue, so the use of cardioprotective therapies like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, aspirin, statin, should be reviewed in light of the diagnosis and the presence of other medical comorbidities and dosage reductions of some of the therapies may be considered. Individuals may experience more gastrointestinal side effects from aspirin with poor dietary intake or concurrent steroid use. Individuals on aspirin and steroid should be considered for gastric protection with a PPI or a suitable alternative. Oral hyperglycemic agents and or insulin should be reviewed and the targets for glucose control agreed. We'll look at this target in the next slides. Again, a very commonly asked question in the exams. In fact, this uh, target was asked in the recently concluded SC exam in 2024. Weight loss may mean a reduced need for OHAs and or insulin or offer potential for simplification of glucose control regimen. So looking at the medications management, the non-insulin therapies, what are they looking at? Metformin, SUs, pioglitazones, gliptins, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. Clearly the risk of hypoglycemia is the least. I mean, no risk with metformin, with pio, and with GLP-1 receptor agonist. There is low risk with gliptins and SGLT2 inhibitors as well. The maximum risk or the moderate risk is with SUs like gliclazide, gliplizide, glimepramide, and ripaglinide. And that too, the safest among them is gliclazide. So we should always consider reviewing the doses of this as is clearly mentioned. For example, we review the dose uh, according to the changing renal function for metformin. Uh, as soon as the renal function is reduced, we should even consider reducing the dose of SUs. Uh, the uh, uh, pioglitazone, we need to be careful, especially in terms of uh, uh, its uh, risk uh, with bladder tumors or heart failures for that matter. And uh, gliptins are uh, usually uh, pretty safe in that matter in, in context that uh, we should only review the doses if the renal functions deteriorates and there is a, redu a reduction in the dose for the gliptins with uh, reducing renal function. And uh, GLP-1 uh, agonist as well, a review if eating patterns change or significant weight loss occurs, and we should consider withdrawing it if abdominal pain or pancreatitis develops as well. And SGLT2 inhibitors as well, stop if evidence of clinical dehydration, peripheral vascular disease, foot ulceration in acute illness, and pre-surgery. Test for ketones if there is acute illness. So. These are some things which we should keep in mind for these medications uh, as a part of non-insulin therapy in these category of patients. What about insulin therapies? What should we be considered in the end of life care scenario for type one and type two diabetic patients? Doses may need to change with changes in renal function, including those in the renal replacement therapy. Hypoglycemia risk will need to be reassessed with changes in eating patterns. A change of insulin regimen may be needed to match Changes in the activity levels, equipment for insulin delivery may need to be reassessed if physical capabilities alter, vision is poor, carers become involved in giving insulin. Evening isophane insulin, insulatard or eumelinai or in insulomine basal uh, in combination with the daytime oral hypoglycemic drugs may be the good first-line treatment choice in individuals with type 2 diabetes. The simplest regimen should be chosen if switching to insulin only. Both once or twice daily injection can be considered. And if it is once, we usually prefer giving it in the morning time. Consider using an analog basal insulin if the individual is at high risk of hypoglycemia. 
Anytime in, uh, analog insulins are better. Do not stop insulin in individuals with type 1 diabetes, as we already have seen in that pathway. So that's the end of my free view for this. If you like to have uh, listen to the full session for these guidelines, uh, do subscribe to my lecture series. My lecture series so far has around 74 lectures. And if you do subscribe to the lecture series, uh, you will get access to all the existing 74 lectures plus the full session for this uh, guidelines as well. Thank you so much. So this all will be covered further in the uh, full uh, access to the lecture. Thank you so much.